There's an entire group of procedures performed deep inside the eye's interior. They are called vitreoretinal eye surgeries. In this episode of OcuTalk, Dr. Rehan Hussain will be telling us all about the different surgeries classified as vitreoretinal and what the underlying conditions are that make them necessary. Dr. Hussain? I want to talk to you. Not now, later. No, now. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for a brand new episode of OcuTalk. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for a brand new episode of OcuTalk. My name's Nick, and today we have a very special guest joining us, Dr. Rehan Hussein. Dr. Hussein, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on to this interview. Well, Dr. Hussein, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to visit us. Uh, Dr. Hussein, uh, before we get started, I was hoping maybe you could talk to us a little bit about your uh, background and your specialty to our viewers. Sure. So uh, I'm an ophthalmologist that did additional training in virtual retinal surgery. So that was a two-year fellowship I completed after my ophthalmology residency. And so I focus on treating uh, diseases of the back of the eye uh, involving the vitreous cavity and the retina. And so that is uh, pretty fulfilling because it's a variety of both clinic and surgical-based procedures. Uh, you know, frequently I'll treat uh, people with injections of medicine for conditions such as macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy and retinal vein occlusion, but also have the ability to do surgical procedures to fix uh, retinal detachments, macular holes, and uh, complications of diabetes, and even complications of cataract surgery. Well, excellent. Dr. Hussain, thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you again for joining us today. We, we do appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Hussain, uh, for our discussion today, we were hoping that maybe you can discuss with us a little bit about vitreoretinal eye surgery. What exactly is that? Sure. So, I mean, that's a broad term. Uh, basically, uh, there are a number of ways to fix uh, back of the eye problems in the vitreous and the retina, but the most common one that we think about is called uh, vitrectomy surgery. And that involves uh, using uh, small instruments to make three incisions into the sclera or the white part of the eye. And then we remove the vitreous gel, uh, which is what causes floaters. And there are a number of reasons we'll do that. Uh, but I think, you know, retinal detachment is the one that comes to mind most frequently for people. And so we, we remove that gel and then, uh, you know, there are a variety of other steps we might perform depending on indication for the surgery. If the patient has a detached retina, we'll drain the fluid from under the retina, laser any retinal holes or breaks that are there, and then oftentimes put in a gas bubble. Uh, if there's just bleeding in the eye from diabetes, for example, we just clear out the blood and put in laser to prevent future bleeding episodes. So it's a, it's a pretty uh, satisfying variety of, of ways to uh, fix that issue. And, uh, you know, the other types of surgery is also called the scleral buckle, which is for retinal detachment. It involves putting a circular band around the eye, which sort of squeezes it a little bit to, uh, you know, close any retinal breaks. So we have a variety of things that we can do. Well, excellent. Thank you for that explanation, Dr. Hussain. Uh, we appreciate that. And um, Dr. Hussain, are there, different, uh, are there different types of vitreoretinal eye surgeries that we should know about? Yeah, um, you know, I mentioned uh, th those two so far, but there's actually a third one also called a pneumatic retinopexy, which is unique uh, because that's an in-office procedure. It's not actually something that has to go to the operating room. And uh, that one is also used to fix detached retina, and it involves injecting a gas bubble in the eye to flatten the retina, and then we put laser or cryotherapy around retinal breaks. Uh, so that's another one, you know, in addition to the two I mentioned, which is vitrectomy and uh, scleral buckling. Excellent. Well, again, thank you for that explanation, Dr. Hussain. We appreciate that. And what conditions would lead to a patient needing one of these surgeries? Sure. There's a variety of things that can lead to retinal disease. Uh, I would say the most common one is just the aging process, because uh, we all have that vitreous gel, like I'd mentioned before, and it does go through age-related changes. And so oftentimes something called a posterior vitreous attachment will happen which is when that gel liquefies and then it kind of separates from the retina where it's uh, adherent. It's also connected to the optic nerve most of your life, but then it separates. And uh, during that process, there's a chance for retinal tear to develop. And if this is detected early enough, it can actually be treated in the office with a, with a quick uh, laser procedure to just surround the retinal holes with, with laser and seal off the surrounding area. However, if the patient delays seeking care, that can progress to a detached retina, which involves a much more advanced surgery, like I'd mentioned, to the vitrectomies. Uh, other common things would be, you know, diabetes that is poorly controlled that can lead to uh, bleeding episodes in the eye or even what's called the tractional retinal detachment when scar tissue grows on the surface of the retina and pulls it off. And then uh, 
you know, I'd say the other thing would be sometimes after other surgeries, like anterior segment surgeries, such as cataract surgery, sometimes there can be, you know, re remaining lens particles in the back of the eye, and we might have to go in and do a surgery to fix that. Those are some of the common ones. Uh, well, very interesting information, Dr. Hussein. Thank you so much for that. And um, Dr. Hussein, what are the signs or symptoms that people can be on the lookout for to indicate to them that they may need vitreoretinal eye surgery? I'd say the most important one would be any like loss of vision. So if there's a sudden vision loss uh, where the vision gets very blurry suddenly, that would be a, a very serious uh, consideration to go get your eye examined and see if you need vitreoretinal surgery. Uh, onset of many floaters is also one that should be taken seriously. Uh, you know, it's common to have some floaters at baseline, which are those little dots or lines that cross our vision. Uh, but if a, there's a big change in that, that take that seriously. And then also uh, flashing lights in the peripheral vision typically could be a symptom, uh, meaning a retinal tear is forming. And so that should be checked out promptly as well. One other one would be like if the central vision is starting to get distorted and wavy, like instead of seeing straight lines, you know, they're kind of crooked or wavy, that could be a sign that something is changing in the macula that needs attention whether that be scar tissue forming on the macula or swelling of the macula. Oh, well, excellent. Thank you for letting us know about the signs and symptoms, Dr. Hussein. And um, Dr. Hussein, is there someone who's going to be at higher risk at developing a condition leading up to this procedure? I would say uh, for retinal tears and detachments, uh, specifically people that are uh, highly myopic or very nearsighted are at higher risk. They have longer eyes. And so uh, those long eyes have more thin retina as it's kind of stretched longer. And so when that jelly in the eye moves, it, it, it can tug on the retina and those thin uh, myopic retinas are at higher risk for developing tears. So unfortunately, we can't really control that. We're just, you know, people are just born with that. But as long as they're aware of their risks, I think they should be on the lookout for those symptoms. Oh, well, perfect. Again, thank you for that information, Dr. Hussein. And um, Dr. Hussein, I, I know you said that some people, uh, they, they can't really avoid it, but are, are there any preventative measures that patients can take to, to avoid vitreoretinal eye surgery? Well, I would say, uh, you know, routine uh, eye exams are very important. Uh, there are certain risk factors that we can detect ahead of time. Uh, you know, if a patient is found to have uh, lattice degeneration or atrophic retinal holes, uh, some doctors or some retina specialists may consider to laser them ahead of time to reduce the risk of detached retina. Um, you know, for diabetic patients, it's important they get uh, routine uh, screening to see if their retinopathy is progressing or if they have retinopathy at all because if they do uh, have that detected early on, that can be managed with lasers or injections of medicine in the office uh, prior to it advancing to a very serious stage that might require vitreoretinal surgery. Well, excellent. Again, thank you for that information, Dr. Hussein. And um, so we've talked about the actual surgery and uh, now I wanted to ask about, what about the recovery process? What's that like? Yeah, so uh, the recovery process from vitreoretinal surgery is a little bit more long and uh, I would say a little bit more uh, rigorous than that with cataract surgery, which is an, another very common eye surgery. Uh, typically with these vitrectomy surgeries, uh, you know, if they have a detached retina and they have vitrectomy or they have a macular hole, uh, you know, we put a gas bubble in the eye and that can last from about one to two months typically. And that's important to allow the retina to heal. And, you know, it does cause blurred vision in the short term. And so the patient has to be counseled to not expect clear vision immediately. But once that gas bubble dissolves, uh, you know, ideally the retina stays you know, attached or the macular hole is closed, the patient should see improvements in their vision after that. Uh, but it does require more work on the patient. Sometimes they have to keep their head down uh, you know, for up to a week uh, because that gas bubble has to support the retinal hole. And so that is a lot of work. Sometimes these patients will rent these special chairs that have a hole cut out and they're literally keeping their head down like this uh, you know, almost all day. So it's not uh, an easy procedure to recover from, but nonetheless, uh, when patients do kind of follow those uh, compliance rules, they have much better outcomes. So, you know, it's important to tell them about that. Well, amazing information, Dr. Hussain. Again, thank you for that information. And uh, Dr. Hussain, I know you may have talked about it a little bit, and I know with every surgery, there always comes little complications here and there. Uh, but with, with this, uh, are there complications that people should be in the know about? You hit it on the, on the head right there. Every surgery has a potential for complications. So it's important to have a very detailed uh, informed consent process. You know, a lot of times I tell patients that they have like an uh, you know, emergency, like a detached retina, you know, it's definitely in their best interest to get the surgery, but they have to be aware that there's a chance for the unexpected. And so uh, I tell every patient that if you have a vitrectomy surgery, 
you're going to get a cataract. You know, that might be months from now or might be years from now, but it's something to expect. And it's not even a complication, I think. I think it's just part of the sort of what happens after a vitrectomy surgery. Uh, but, you know, other ones to be considerate of are, you know, infection, while extremely rare and like a one in, in the thousand site number that can lead to blindness. Uh, you know, bleeding is something that's a risk for any type of surgery. And so they have to be aware about that. And in most cases, the bleeding just resolves on its own, but it can take a while in other cases. And then I, finally, I would say, you know, high pressure or low pressure can happen after any surgery and that can result in optic neuropathy. And so I also put for every consent, you know, loss of vision, loss of eye. As rare as it is, the patient has to be mentally prepared for that to happen. But I always end it with, listen, the only reason I'm, you know, recommending the surgery is because the odds are in your favor that this is gonna help you out. And you know some of these things, if you delay the care, it will result, result in a worse outcome. So I have to kind of set those appropriate expectations. Well, again, excellent information. Again, thank you, Dr. Hussein, for that. Um, Dr. Hussein, are there other new technologies or new developments that are on the horizon that we should probably be on the lookout for? Yeah, it's a very exciting time for retina. You know, I, I love retina because there's always so many uh, advancements happening. And right now in the surgical space, I think uh, you know. There's been great, you know, advancements just in the past 10 years, but things I'm looking forward to would be like uh, gene therapy, uh, which has uh, already been approved for one rare condition called Leber's congenital amaurosis. Uh, there's a, basically a surgery done, the vitrectomy, and then they inject this uh, gene therapy material underneath the retina, and that can help reverse uh, what was once known as a blinding disorder. And so they're now uh, expanding that indication for many other inherited retinal degenerations and even uh, using it now for very common things such as diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration. And so that's pretty exciting. And they're even making it now so that uh, it can be given in a less invasive manner. Uh, there are clinical trials where they're doing intravitreal or uh, even supracoidal injections of this gene therapy. So while that's not approved yet, it's something to look forward to in the future. And uh, you know, I think the other big focus uh, in retina uh, would be finding a cure for dry macular degeneration. So that's more of a medical retina thing, but uh, I think that's exciting if they, that can get FDA approved. And then I'd say the one last thing is, you know, we're trying to find longer lasting ways to treat our wet macular degeneration patients. So one, uh, aside from longer lasting drugs, one thing that can come out recently is uh, a surgical implant that releases, uh, you know, a drug called uh, ranibizumab uh, continuously over six months. So patients may not have to come back as frequently for injections like they were in our uh, current clinic. Oh, well, excellent. We'll definitely be on the lookout for those new technologies. Dr. Hussein, again, thank you for that information. And uh, Dr. Hussein, before we leave today, was there any other information that you'd like to let our audience know about? I would say just for the general audience, you know, if there's ever a sudden loss of vision or change in vision, uh, don't delay seeking care. I think you should try to get in with your ophthalmologist uh, or optometrist as soon as possible to get that diagnosed because uh, certain things are very time sensitive, uh, especially retinal issues potentially. So I think that's kind of the main take home point, I would say. And I, I suppose for any people who are interested in the healthcare for, you know, field, I would say consider uh, you know, ophthalmology and I'd definitely give a specific plug to vitreoretinal retinal surgery. It's a great field. Oh, well, excellent. Again, everyone, that was Dr. Rehan Hussein. Dr. Hussein, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.